I, I turned around and I looked at Jane when she was, when she was doing the rounds. And I said, Jane, it's monkey walk. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could direct your attention to the stage once again, our next panel is getting ready to uh, get started. The uh, name of this panel is Net Roots, Past, Present, and Future, and it is presented by MoveOn.org. I'm sure many of you have heard of that organization. MoveOn.org is a service that provides tools for involving real Americans in the political process. Currently working together with its 3.2 million members to realize the progressive promise of our country by influencing congressional decisions and elections. Today's panel will be moderated by Elise Hogue, is the communications director of MoveOn.org. So, uh, Ms. Hogue, if you'll please welcome Elise Hogue, she'll introduce the rest of the panel members. Can you hear me? Does that work? Um, first off, before we get started, I encourage all you folks to move up if you want to. We wanted a really friendly, conversational uh, discussion about the role of the net roots, and we won't uh, be offended if you go in and out. We're mostly online people, so people come in and out of our websites all the time. So if you're so inclined, definitely move up to the front. Um, I want to introduce our panel for today. To my left, we have Marcos Melitsas, sorry, um, founder of Daily Coast, progressive powerhouse blog, and an author of a great new book you guys all need to run out and get called Taking on the System. Eli Perzer, the executive director of MoveOn.org. Christy Harden Smith, who hails from West Virginia and is an editor at the widely read blog Fire Dog Lake, and Bobby Clark, the executive director of Progress Now. We have a few questions that we wanted to discuss to get rolling, but we're hoping that you guys will also join in the conversation, ask whatever it is that you want to ask as we move along. We don't have a lot of time, but what we have are some of the leaders of one of the most vibrant arms of the progressive movement that has changed the face of progressive politics during the Bush administration. And we're looking forward to hearing their thoughts on a whole bunch of questions. So welcome, you guys. And um, I want to start by, I don't know, I think I'm going to go to Christy first. Christy, why don't you tell us a little bit different, a little bit about what's different now than when you came into progressive politics. Tell us how you came in and what your impressions are about what's changed. I started basically because I was ticked off at how the 2004 election went, which I'm sure a lot of you were as well. Um, and I had a daughter. Uh, she was about a year old at the time the election happened, and I was worried about what things were going to be for her future. Um, you know, you look at your child and you think, if the, can things keep going this way, what kind of, of world is she going to be dealing with as an adult? So I just started, actually, I started on Daily Coast. Um, commenting about the Scooter Libby case and ran into Jane Hampshire that I blog with. Uh, and Jane and I found that we were both obsessed with the Fitzgerald investigation at that point. And, and, you know, we started out emailing each other and then would call and be on the phone for an hour and, um, you know, then started blogging together and it just kind of took off from there. Um, and, you know, the difference now, I think, is there are so many more voices who are involved. There are so many more people who are, are active. And I think it's basically because you know, we look at all of the problems and we don't see things, you know, coming in terms of solutions from the top down. So if we don't do the work from the bottom up, things just aren't going to get done. Great. And Eli, uh, you, a lot's changed since you actually joined MoveOn. Tell us a little bit about it. Sure. I mean, I, I um, found myself in this whole progressive politics world kind of by accident. I, it wasn't something that I... Uh, intended as my career, but basically after September 11th, um, I put up a website calling for kind of multilateral approach to responding to, uh, to al-Qaeda that would actually, you know, bring the world's community together rather than driving us further apart. And uh, the website I put up, I sent it to a few friends, kind of thought I was done and was just bowled over. Uh, when all of a sudden there were, there were half a million people from 192 countries who had signed on. And, you know, I was 20 years old at the time. Uh, you know, I was going home from my day job and writing emails and trying to figure out what's next. And, um, and that's really how I got started. And it, as, especially as we went into the Iraq war and, and the march to war, um, it became clear 
that there were sort of two big problems. One was that the Democratic Party, you know, I, I, I sort of had this impression just as an outsider, and it was totally, you know, naive, but I had this impression that they kind of, that, that it was a real party that, that, that had real people in it, uh, that was a strong institution, and uh, that it was going to kind of take care of uh, prosecuting the case against the war. Not true. Um, and, uh, you know, then I also thought, you know, that there was kind of a, um, you know, a, a series of progressive institutions that had built up. And there were a bunch of kind of single issue groups that were doing good work. But the sense of kind of a progressive movement, the sense of, okay, here's President Bush, he's going after everything we care about on every issue, just wasn't there. And so I think that's the most, both of those things have changed profoundly in the last uh, eight years. And absolutely by necessity, just through people like Christy and you know, millions of others saying, look, like, we just can't afford to let these, let these institutions wither anymore. We've got to drive more people into the Democratic Party. We've got to make it more of a people-driven thing. And we've got to build a progressive movement that could actually move our issues and challenge the party. And you know, I think we're still a long way from where we need to be, but we're so far from where we were in 2002 when you really had a party that was mostly focused on raising money and, and putting on TV ads, and when you really had a, a, a movement that was overly focused on, on these single issue silo groups and didn't really see the need to make common cause or to engage politically against our, our common enemies. Marcos, I remember first um, hearing your name in a New York Times profile about this thing that they still put in quotes in the paper that was blogging, and you were at the Democratic National Convention blogging, but I know you got involved before that. Tell us a little bit about it. First, before I, I do that, I want to make something clear, and maybe a lot of people know that, but when we talk about the net roots, there's a sort of perception that it's blogging, that blogging is the net roots. And in fact, blogging is sort of a tiny little sliver of net roots. Net roots really are people who are using technology to wage politics online. I mean, that's what the net roots is. And, and that's everything from one of the pioneers, which is obviously Move On and Eli over here, uh, to people putting up the little Obama sticker on their Facebook page to uh, a Google group where somebody uh, blasts out their list of 12 family members and some friends. I mean, that's all Netroots activity. Uh, video blogging, uh, the YouTube stuff. I mean, so when there's always this, what do the Netroots think? Or, or, or Obama, he has a really bad relationship with the Netroots. And it's like, dude, the, the dude exists because of the Netroots, right? Maybe not because of a specific blogger or two, but his campaign has been built on a digital foundation. So the net roots isn't a one person. It's not me. It's not just people on this, on this stage. It's not any one medium. It's this broader context of, of using technology. It's even cell phone, using cell phones to, to, uh, to organize. So that's sort of what the, what the net roots uh, is. Uh, and I just also want to point out that um, uh, Move On, I think, has a lot of responsibility for, for Barack Obama. I mean, they raised with two emails, what, about $3.1 million? in 2004, at a time when Republicans were wondering, who are we going to run against this guy? Two days later, or a week later, he's got 3.1 million in the bank, and everybody sort of said, yeah, we're not going to touch this one. So, so this is the sort of thing that, I mean, clearly Obama is, is, is very much, I think, in that which creation, would not have been able to defeat a, somebody like Hillary Clinton with that kind of institutional backing without strong net root support. Um, so, and there was a question about, <laughs> sort of how things have changed since you first got involved. Oh, yeah. Um, so when, when, when we started, I mean, if you, if you talk to the traditional media, I mean, I'm getting the same questions today that I was getting in 2004. So it's like, so uh, do you guys think you actually have a point? I mean, why do you bother existing? I mean, can we just do the job and you go home and stop bothering us and criticizing? I mean, it's the same crap. And uh, so, uh, and I always, I'm always saying like, didn't I answer you in 2004 when you asked oh. this question? So it, it's um, from that regard. But, but what's happening is that we're finding, and this is what taking on the system is really about, is that people are bypassing these established gatekeepers, right? Whether we're seeing it in politics here, in the, both the political establishment and in the media establishment. We're, we're bypassing what they're doing. And, and there's no better example than Stephen Colbert's speech to the White House pre press correspondent dinners, because if it was up to the traditional press, nobody would have ever heard what happened. But of course, thanks to YouTube and, and even iTunes library, it was the number one download in iTunes library for weeks. And this is the same uh, week that Pearl Jam had a new album. So Stephen Colbert's speech to a, really a comedy bit to political reporters was more popular than Pearl Jam, which is pretty damn cool. So 
So we're finding that there's ways to get around these establishment gatekeepers, and not just in politics, but in anything from sports to culture to music to whatever it is, people, these elites who have sat there from their penthouses in either LA or, or uh, Manhattan, or their townhouses in DC, uh, claiming to speak for, for everybody in the country, uh, we're finding that the rest of the country now is saying, you know what, and you don't speak for us, and since we live in the rest of the country, we can now actually tell you how we truly think. And it's really invigorating things. So maybe the traditional media and the political, well, the traditional media still doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. The political establishment, I think, hates us, but has no choice of except that we exist. They're going to tolerate us. And, uh, and as for people, clearly, uh, we're in a world now where a lot more people are engaged and, uh, and, and becoming active participants in their politics as opposed to mere spectators. Great. Bobby, you've uh, participated in a lot of different pieces of the net roots that Marcos just laid out. Tell us about it and what you see has changed. I, I had a similar experience to uh, Eli. I was sort of an accidental um, progressive uh, online activist. I think we all are. I think, <laughs> I think we all are. Um, how, many, how many people here? How many people here? Uh, um, I, so I actually wasn't doing, uh, I hadn't done anything uh, politically online until Howard Dean came along. And uh, I heard Howard speak at an event here in Colorado, and two months later I was in Burlington, uh, one of the early staffers. And uh, when I look back to the kinds of resources we had available uh, in the early days of the Dean campaign, it's incredible how much things have changed now. Look at what Obama has compared to what we had at the start of the Dean campaign. It's just amazing. Um, and I think there are a couple of a couple things that really stick out to me. One is, is just the, the technology changes. I mean, YouTube was launched in 2006. YouTube didn't exist before that. Um, I, I, it's hard to think about that, but YouTube's only been around since 2006. So, um, it, you know, the, the ability to get something on YouTube quickly has literally ch altered the face of politics. Um, you know, they, everybody knows what happened in the Virginia uh, race, the macaca moment back in 2006, but uh, here just a couple of weeks ago in Colorado, uh, uh, a 60-year-old librarian gets, gets kicked, uh, kicked away from a McCain event for holding up a sign that says McCain equals Bush. Um, and she was hauled off, even though there were other people holding up signs. Um, and we happened to be there with a camera, our organization Progress Now, and we happened to be there with a camera, and we were able to put it on YouTube. The blogs picked it up. It got all over the blogs. And by that evening, it was on Countdown with Keith Overman. And it was one of the top stories of the day. <laughs> So it's, it's just that fast how a story can change, how, how a story can become national now uh, because of the technology that's available. And then just the explosion of people. It's absolutely incredible um, the number of people who are going online and taking advantage of all those resources available and, and using these new social medias to influence their friends and, and, and neighbors. Um, and it's really bringing people back into politics. There was a sign that I'll never forget above the, the web team uh, at the Dean Campaign Office that said the revolution will not be televised. Uh, because you know there was a strong belief that that broadcast television had actually uh, caused Americans to sit back in our chairs and be receivers of information um, rather than participants, um, and there may be a lot of truth to that. And one of the things that seems to be true of the internet is that it's it's because it's created the 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 capacity and the ability for people to engage in 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 ways never before possible. It's actually bringing people back into politics. People are participating more. I mean, that's really what the big tent is all about. We have. 500 bloggers who are here working feverishly downstairs covering, covering you know, an important national event. Uh, I mean, it's, it's participation on an epic scale, and it's only, it's only growing. So if you guys had to think, and gals, had to think back um, and come up with one moment where you had this epiphany of like, this Netroots thing, it might actually take off that crystallized that, one impact, what would it be? Eli? I guess it would be, I mean, it would be the morning in September when I went to my email box having sent out something to 30 people and had 5,000 emails in my inbox. And there was just this, I, I literally couldn't figure out like who all these people were and where they were coming from. I like had no idea. and. You know, what had happened was basically I had sent something out, uh, it resonated, people sent it on, and there was this word of mouth phenomenon that was kind of completely invisible from a, from a media standpoint, but, you know, very persuasive because people were, were getting it from their good friends and, and neighbors and whatever. And, you know, I think, the, I think the, the very particular moment when it sort of clicked for me, like, oh, this is pretty cool stuff, 
was uh, like a day later, I got a call from a journalist in Romania. And she said that she had received the email I sent to my friends. Um, that's another thing that's changed. The iPhone uh, has introduced interference to the uh, panel process. But um, uh, that may be mine. Anyway, um, <laughs> I was talking to a journalist who, who was in Romania who had received the same email that I had sent to my friends five times from five different people. And it, it just impressed upon me the power of these networks if we're able to harness them well. I mean, that's just sort of, there, there's such power in the social capital that we all have that if you can, if you can effectively use it politically, you know, it can just change everything. Marcos, your aha moment. I, I, um, I was doing a lot of election blogging. Uh, that was sort of the niche that Daily Coast established early on. And, and my, my uh, sort of blogging in arms was uh, Jerome Armstrong at MyDD. And we were both sort of tag teaming, writing about the, the midterm elections in 2002. And it was, later, it was late in 2002 when, uh, when Jerome had decided that, that, that uh, um, Howard Dean was going to be the, the candidate. And of course, you know, nobody knew how Howard Dean was at the time. And Howard Dean thought he was going to run a race based on health care, right? So it was like a... And uh, Joe Trippi wasn't campaign manager at the time, but he was, some, he was a senior advisor. And he was quoted in an obscure alt-weekly somewhere, but of course the web changes that. Everything's national now, right? Saying, I don't even remember what it was. So Jerome wrote this, you know, Joe Trippi is an idiot, and if Howard Dean is ever going to have a chance, as though anybody thought he had a chance to begin with, you know, he can't run this kind of, this kind of campaign. He's going to have to do it differently. And I think he was talking about the war being an important issue. Um, although this is 2002, so it was pre-war. So I'm not, I don't even rem remember what it was. And, and a couple hours later, he got an email from Joe Trippi saying, no, what I really meant with, was this. And we're like, what the hell is Joe Trippi doing reading us, right? And it's like, wait a second, Joe Trippi's reading us. And it was that moment where we realized, we're, well, maybe we're just not talking to a bunch of political geeks like us, that maybe at some point we're going to start reaching decision makers. And, uh, and actually, uh, I, you know, it, this is 2002. We're not talking about influence. We're not talking about credibility. We're just saying, like, wow, you know, um, just it was going beyond this sort of really tight-knit group, which is what we were at the beginning, is this tight, tiny little group of uh, political junkies. Christy? I, I think the thing that really hit me early on was when we were doing our Libby coverage, um, we were digging into a lot of the original legal documents um, because we kept seeing news reports that were complete spin and were not accurate legally. I'm a, I'm a former attorney. I used to be a prosecutor. and. I would, you know, see these process stories about this is going on in the grand jury, and this is, and it would be wrong. I mean, it would just be legally wrong what they were talking about. They were clearly getting it from someone's attorney. You know, we suspected it was coming from from Bob Luskin, who was Carl Rove's attorney. But you know, I would do these pieces on our blog, smacking back at this is utterly wrong. You know, legally, why aren't these reporters talking to lawyers? And I started getting emails from all of the reporters who were covering the case, and they were asking me legal process questions for background in their stories. And I'm like, don't you guys have lawyers on staff? I mean, you know, you're at these big newspapers. You're at these big, you know, TV journalism. Don't you people have lawyers that, you know, you, you check with or that you source with? And, and when we got to the trial, when we were covering the trial, a lot of them were telling me that the background pieces that Jane was doing on the media process and that I was doing on the legal end were forming a lot of the basis of the questions they were asking to do follow-up for the sources who were trying to feed them spin in the first place. It was like we were feeding the smack back. It was the, it, you know, you never expect that to happen. And, you know, we see that over and over. I mean, when we all started doing rubber stamp Republicans in the 2006 election from, you know, the Netroots talking about that, that made its way into the, the mainstream media. And suddenly, you know, in the 2006 election cycle, you know, the, the pushback on the Republican Party was they were all rubber stamp Republicans. And suddenly that just kind of caught fire and became the, one of the key phrases for the 2006 election cycle. It was one of the reasons that in a lot of races people were talking about, you know, well, they were tired of having a rubber stamp representative, so they voted them out. And, you know, to see that happen was just, I mean, it was amazing. You know, it, it starts with three or four people who are pissed off and who take some action. And with that action, it just kind of snowballs. And it's just been amazing to see, to see that happen. Bobby? For me, it was probably June 30th of 2003, um, which is the last day of the second quarter of Dean's presidential race. 
And Zach Exley had taken a leave for Move On and come up to Burlington and was uh, sort of taking us through a, a boot camp to, to help us learn how to on, uh, organize online better. Uh, because there was so much energy uh, online uh, around Dean already, and Marcos was part of that, and Jerome, and, uh, and the campaign wasn't engaging as well as we, as we needed to. And so Zach came and worked with us, and, and it led up to uh, the end of the, there's always, you know, in any presidential race, every, or every quarter is a big milestone because you have to um, file these reports with the Federal Election Commission, and the more money you raise, then the more buzz you get with the press, and the more, the more strength their campaign looks like it has. So it was definitely, we wanted to, you know, we had a big goal to want to raise money. And we also wanted to, 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 to do a better job of engaging people online uh, because we, we knew that we had to. We had a, a little known governor from a small state and if we were going to reach people, it was going to have to be online. We had no money. Um, so we, we had this email campaign uh, lined up and, and, we were, and the governor was beginning to, to speak out on the, uh, it was an active opponent of the war. People were coming to us online in that way. Um, he also was a, a vocal opponent of the religious right. Um, he took a stand against uh, Rick Santorum from Pennsylvania when he said some awful things about gay people, and we doubled our database overnight. Uh, people were responding to that. I mean, literally, the governor would say something, and people were, were you know, anxious to hear somebody speaking out and being, being a strong progressive leader, and then they were responding online, and we just kept growing and growing. And then finally, at the last day of the second quarter, we had a campaign going where we were, um, it was actually a first, I think, for presidential politics where we actually set a goal of what we wanted to raise. Rather than trying to downplay expectations and then surprise everybody with a big number after the end of the quarter, we actually uh, had a goal of what we wanted to achieve. And that was, that was courageous because we were trusting people to respond and, 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 we even, and we were very transparent about it. We said, you know, this is important. This is an important thing we need to do. We need to show the strength of our campaign. Um, and, and it ended on it, the last day of, two, uh, of, of June with an $800,000 fundraising day, which at the time was just almost unheard of. And, and the entire political world was turned on its head that day. I remember watching all the coverage. Um, Chris, I remember Chris Matthews saying he'd never seen anything like it. He said in newsrooms across the country and every campaign office, everyone's hit, on the Dean campaign website hitting refresh, 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 watching the, watching the bat, the, our thermometer, fill up. Um, and that there was a, one person who commented on our blog that day, um, and he said, I'll never forget it, he said, finally a candidate we own. Uh, because you know, it was transparent that it was obvious that it was these small contributions adding up to a lot, and, and, and the people who were, who were participating understood what was happening. They understood this incredible shift that was happening. This was a candidate who was being funded by the net roots, by ordinary working people who were uh, taking advantage of the opportunities they had through technology to engage with the campaign. The campaign was doing, doing some things right at that point to, to make it easier for those people to engage and trying to get out of the way of, of their engagement. Um, and it was just a phenomenal day. It was absolutely remarkable. And that was the day, I think, for me that uh, it really hit home that there's been a sea change in politics and, and it will never be the same again. Um, you know, and, and it's the campaign certainly didn't end the way we wanted it to, but I think that, 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 we, that everyone associated with the campaign and MoveOn.org uh, and all of the tremendous bloggers who pioneered the way in blogging, um, really in, that, in those couple of years, 2003 and 2004, there was just a, a dramatic change. So let's bring it more recent, this election cycle, and I'm going off script here, so I'll, I'll seed it a little bit so you have a little bit of time, but I think people have been, this is the election cycle that everybody knows that the net roots existed. And at Move On, we had this moment that was really crystallized when all of our members started going, superdelegates? What's a superdelegate? Never heard of a superdelegate before. And then the um, Clinton donor letter leaked. And we were able to turn that around and show that people power can confront establishment by our members committing to support and make up for the donations that the donors were threatening to revoke if Nancy Pelosi didn't step back on her, the superdelegates should wait and let the people choose. So for you guys in this cycle, in this presidential race, what has been that moment that best demonstrates what the net roots are capable of? Marcos. Um, very recent, actually. Um, you know, bloggers have been talking about John McCain's houses for months now, right, months. and. Uh, there was no, completely no traction in the traditional media. 
we were in a campaign that was sort of, sort, you know, sort of revolving around who was more elitist, right? And then you have John McCain who has $600 loafers and 12, 8, 15 houses, nobody knows. Not even John McCain knows how many houses he has. And uh, somehow that wasn't relevant to this debate over who was elitist. I mean, it was, it, it was nonsensical. Um, there was a, uh, a sort of planning meeting with uh, the, the folks over at Brave New Films and Cagro at uh, Daily Coast and some other people. And they talked about how cool it would be to do a video with the houses. So let, let's do something. So Brave New Films put together a video, sort of highlighting all, all his houses. Uh, it went viral. And two days later, Politico sat down with, with John McCain to ask, and asked him the famous question, like, you know, because they've been seeing all, all these houses. So well, how many houses do you have? Of course, and the rest is history. So there was a moment where something that, that we've been talking about, the media didn't want to touch for who God knows what reason, suddenly finally made that jump. Into, into traditional media, it's become almost a corner, you know, like a keystone of the Democratic case against uh, John McCain. Anyone else got one? I mean, does it have to be a presidential one? Because I no. can... No, no, just... You know, we, we do a lot of work with congressional candidates, just like everybody else up here does as well. Um, we had a candidate who just won yesterday in Florida, Alan Grayson, who was a challenger to the establishment candidate um, who was supported by most of the establishment folks. Alan Grayson's a lawyer um, who has taken on Halliburton and Blackwater and a lot of the war profiteer companies who've really benefited from you know, the no big contracts that Dick Cheney and George Bush have handed out. And he, he, I mean, he's really done amazing work. Uh, and the thought of him you know, on a committee with um, Henry Waxman or John Conyers being able to ask you know, critical questions that need to be asked is just a phenomenal thing and, and we started supporting him really early on because we loved his voice and nobody gave us any hope that he was going to win it was totally poo-pooed you know by all the folks in dc and he didn't get any support from the d trip and you know in his primary and he just he just won i mean he kicked butt in the election yesterday and and we've had that happen over and over and over again with progressive candidates that we've supported because they had a strong voice for progressive issues there's such a hunger for people who stand up for stuff and I think we've seen that across the board with so many candidates that you know all of us have have worked for. And I think Governor Dean is a great example of that right. from from the you know the earlier election. Right. I'll give a uh, I'll give a uh, non-presidential example as well. <clears throat> there was so there's a big Senate race in Colorado this year. It's one of the top targeted Senate races. Mark Udall uh, against Bob Schaefer, and um, the uh, Schaefer is a very conservative, extremely conservative candidate. In Progress Now has done some research on him for a few months now uh, because we're opposed uh, to just about every position he has. And uh, uh, in, in the course of our research, one of the things we discovered was that uh, he had he was very much uh, a part of Jack Abramoff's uh, plan in, in, in the early part of, of uh, 2002 and three uh, to oppose any kind of reform that would um, change what was happening in the Mariana Islands. Um, there was the scheme that had been set up so the Mariana Islands could effectively, um, could legally create American-made sweatshops and recruit uh, these Chinese workers and uh, thinking they're coming to America and then dump them on this island and, uh, and pay them uh, slave wages and put them in terrible working conditions. And there were uh, all sorts of reports that came out of the State Department about forced abortions and just, just horrible, horrible conditions. And in going through his congressional files, one of the things we discovered, well, we, we looked at, at his uh, itinerary and it didn't look like it was much of an investigative trip and we came up with, uh, we found um, a, a photo of him um, on that trip where he was parasailing. Um, so on his investigative trip to the Mariana Islands to investigate the sweatshops, he was uh, investigating the sweatshops that were a couple hundred feet in the air uh, over the ocean. Um, so we, we knew that that, we knew that was out there. We knew that that was something that, that could potentially, uh, that was important for people to know about. Um, we weren't quite sure how it was going to come up because, as you pointed out, Marcos, there can be a story that's hanging out there and the, and the traditional press, you know, can just let it lie forever, it seems, even though it's really relevant to, to a campaign. And so um, Schaefer himself actually um, um, opened the door for it to be brought up. He was interviewed. He'd been sort of laying low for a while. And he was interviewed finally by the Denver Post, and the, and the interview was actually about immigration. And, uh, and he responded, he said, you know, I actually know a program 
um, that I think is a model of, of, uh, of how a immigra U.S. immigration policy should work in the Mariana Islands. And uh, our entire staff, we came into work the next day, we were just stunned that, that he actually said that. Um, and um, so we blogged it, um, and then we reached out to Colorado bloggers and got them to blog about it. And then we reached out to some national bloggers, and then national bloggers started picking up, and then it became this absolute firestorm. And not only, so there was some information that we had, that we knew about. We got it, on, we got it posted, we got the, we got the photograph up. Uh, and then it just took off. Then there was this just spontaneous organizing with, the, with, with bloggers and others who were sharing information, um, doing, doing collaborative research. We had people in probably five or six different states, bloggers, uh, who just jumped in and started organizing uh, through email and uh, uh, calling each other the, and sharing whatever information they had. Uh, and bloggers really drove that story. The story, the, the, the traditional press followed. Um, and, um, you know, in the Denver Post, and, and to their credit, one of the reporters for the Denver Post, the reporter who got the immigration story, did a follow-up, and then he did three front page stories uh, helping break more information about it. But it, it really was this incredibly mature um, blogosphere and, and, and Netroots community that made that happen, that got out this incredibly important, relevant story. I don't have one moment, but I, but I just want to say, um, I think if you look at the structure of the Obama campaign's field efforts, it is impossible to, to imagine putting something like that together. I mean, it's really one of the most exciting things that I've read about based on public information, because I can't know anything private about it. But, um, but, it, but it's, it's really exciting, because what they're doing essentially is engaging people online and then connecting them up with teams offline uh, that you know that then report back numbers online. It's it's this process of integration between real on the ground work and uh, you know and mobilizing people online and reaching out to people online. Um, and so you know it's it's I think for for four, you know four years now we've been working at Move On on trying to figure out this this problem of how do you get people not just doing stuff on their computers but actually. You know, I've I've always kind of had a, um, I've I've never loved the word net roots because I think the, the one problem with it is that it implies that these are like internet people, that they're like somehow some different group of people from like regular people or whatever, and actually when you meet them and when you meet us, you know, it's it's just a group of people who use the internet because we can't get, you know, we can't get through in in normal ways, and so. Um, you know, I think uh, the way that the campaign is actually reaching out to people, you know, doing the kind of the vice presidential text message thing, you know, these are kind of very smart tactics that are integrating what's happening online with what's happening offline. And my hope is that that's like a model for um, how politics works in the future. And it's one of the reasons I'm so excited about this campaign, actually, is because you know, I think we, we have to make it a model for that. That's kind of one of the things that's on the line. I think if Obama loses, there will be a whole class of Democratic consultants who will come in and say, see, all of this stuff is just kind of, you know, it's just hand wavy, you know, uh, what we really need to do is some, some ads. Let's get more ads on the air. And so I think that's one of the things that's at stake this year. All right, well, we've done some really good looking back at the history of the net roots. So let's move in. And we're running out of time, which I didn't realize. So. Um, I Let's do lightning round. A couple questions about the future, so then we can take a couple questions from the audience. Um, in 30 seconds, Marcos, what do we need to do better moving forward? I, I don't know about better. I mean, I think we just need to keep doing what we're doing, and, and things are evolving organically. And I yield the rest of my time. <laughs> Eli? You know, I think we need to keep building power. I mean, I think that's, that's you know, the project, is there's still an awful lot of a lock on power in Washington from the, from the lobbyists, from the big companies, um, and we need to get smarter and we need to get more sophisticated about, you know, getting real people represented. And that's a hard project. I mean, that's the, the hard project. Um, and it's, it's not gonna happen overnight, and you can see it, you know, you can see people crashing the gates. Um, but, uh, but that's, the, that's the thing that we have to keep doing. We're not there yet. Christy? Um, I think the key word is, is accountability in terms of what we do. Um, one of the things that we do a lot of on Fire Dog Lake is a very activist sort of thing. We have folks making calls to Congress, setting up meetings with their, their Congress people. 
Um, when you see someone who is very frustrated but they don't have any outlet for it and you give them some outlet to really take action, it's amazing where that can take them. You know, taking the one action and seeing a little bit of a result from it just kind of snowballs and they get other people involved and other people involved and the next thing you know, things start to really change and I think that's really where, where we are right now, empowering people to do the things that they really can do themselves. Um. So I think one of the things that organizations that do work online uh, could do better at is uh, the technology is there to distribute power. The internet is a power distribution system. Uh, it's totally possible for, for ordinary citizens to, to claim power and to, and to use it. I think what still exists are organizations. I think there, there's, there's a tendency for organizations to just want to be top down and hierarchical. And I think that that's, I, I, maybe it's human nature, I don't know what it is, but, but there are, um, I think there's still a big barrier to just organizational thinking on the left um, so that organizations can get out of the way um, and, and provide more access for people to participate, engage with them, be part of, their, uh, of, of uh, moving an agenda forward because the technology's there. Uh, I think there, there are still too many organizations that are creating barriers for, their, for people to engage. And one word. Who is the Bush administration figure you will miss the most? Start over there. I got to whittle down from 2,000 of them to one. I don't. Uh, I don't know that I can. I can Dick name Cheney. one. Dick Cheney. <laughs> Dick Cheney. There you go. David yep. Addington. Say it again. David Addington. Great. I think we have time for literally one question. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, for anyone who couldn't hear, what role do each of the panelists see for advocating for public funding of elections and progressive politics? Um, in theory, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a good theory. The, the details are actually very, very important on this issue. And I'd actually even go beyond, and I'd like to see a complete reexamination of the campaign finance regime, because I think right now it's so complex that to run for office you almost need to hi hire a high-priced attorney to keep tabs on all the regulations. And it's so easy to run afoul. And that is actually become a new gate. So I'd love to see a complete reexamination of the entire thing because there's this notion that money in politics is bad. And you're actually, compared to the rest of the industry, not that much money in politics. What's bad is influence, is buying your politicians. So money's not bad, it's the influence buying that's bad. And we need to make that distinction and create law that uh, acknowledges that. We have a, a book salon regularly on Fired Ugly where we have folks come in. Michael Walbin's going to be at FDL on Sunday. Um, he was a speechwriter for President Clinton, but he works for the Brennan Center for Justice and does a huge amount of work on election law. And that's one of the big issues we'll be talking with Michael on Sunday. It's at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So if anybody wants to drop by, we'll be talking about that on Sunday. I'd agree with Marcos. It's about influence. Uh, I think it's bigger than, than, than even election reform. I think it's also um, lobbying reform. Uh, you know, there, there are too many ways that influence is, can, be, can be purchased um, and, and we, the whole system needs to be rethought so that we can make sure that we have an accountable government. I, you know, I, I would just say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm totally for public financing actually, but I think progressives sometimes fixate on that kind of stuff as like the cure-all. If only we can make this little shift, you know, if we can only kind of tweak this one thing or that one thing you know, that'll fix our problems. And actually, I think it's, it's just a pure movement building problem. It's a pure question of whether we're able to kind of aggregate uh, citizens outside and, and pierce the Washington bubble, you know, and pop it. And, you know, if we're able to do that, that, that will change those dynamics regardless of what the rules are. So it's, you know, so it's both. You have to change the rules, but you, but you can't ignore the larger dynamics that we're trying to, to build is if you see something that you think is a problem, you can't wait for somebody else to change it because they probably won't. You have to step up and do it yourself. And, and you can get that ball roll. I mean, if I can do it from West Virginia, from my house, with a three-year-old hanging off me from when I first started blogging, then anybody can do it. I mean, really. Yep. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Some of the panelists will be around afterwards. Otherwise, you know where to find them online. Give me, uh, join me in giving them a Great thanks for being with us today. This is just the beginning of the conversation, not the end. Thank you so much.